Okay, very good morning. It is Wednesday the 16th of December. Hope you're doing well and just an early heads up. Uh, if you haven't already done so, remember you can join us on Amplify Live this evening, full FOMC coverage for myself and the team. So the initial statement coming out at 7 p.m. We'll be doing a full rundown and live coverage as it comes out. And we've also got the masterclass happening this evening where we've got a special industry guest speaker as well joining us. So uh, don't forget to, if you're watching this on YouTube, check out the link below to get access to that. But let's get straight into it and talk about what's moving markets this morning. And we had a higher close on Wall Street yesterday, seemingly then snapping this four day losing streak in US equities as optimism is quite high, intensifying of talks on, on in Washington on Capitol Hill to try and get this relief bill over the line. And so focus was very much on those congressional leaders from both parties. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell came out last night uh, upon conclusion of a number of calls that Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, was having with uh, various different departments and team members um, about how lawmakers, McConnell said, he will keep them in Washington until a deal gets done. And that kind of commitment was met with kind of mild relief that ultimately it looks like things might happen. And of course, the pressure is on because these negotiators are working flat out to try and final, finalise a coronavirus uh, aid to attach to a package of spending bills, which they will need to push through by Friday at midnight in order to keep government agencies funded. And so hence, that's the, the timeline they're working towards. So it, it might be that you know we're in Wednesday now, it could just do, still be another few days of haggling over the finer details, but the market's still pretty hopeful in terms of market reaction and positioning that a deal does get done. And that's been one of the main things from overnight. So higher close on Wall Street, the S&P Dow up around 1.3, 1.1% respectively, the Nasdaq up around a similar margin. Uh, and then they handed the baton to the Asia Pacific region, which kind of followed suit and generally uh, higher across the region. So this morning, stock futures, uh, s and pretty flat, but importantly, just holding on to the, the relative gains that were seen yesterday, as you can see here in the center right. Uh, just coming up to a little bit of near-term resistance here uh, at around what was the uh, early Asia-Pacific Open, a retest we had in the middle of that session and a European Open test this morning. Uh, price getting a little squeezed up from the low point uh, and yesterday's R1, which was around the final half an hour into the rally that we had on Wall Street in the futures market. So worth just keeping an eye here as this, this price gets squeezed in. If it continues to remain that way during European morning, perhaps then the volume pickup might see a breakout in another direction as we go into the NYSE session. We've also got that high as well, the weekly high, uh, which was printed uh, going back on Monday uh, that we'll see just above these current levels. So around 89.50 is the overnight highs and then around 60, 61 is that uh, weekly high that we'll be keeping an eye on today if we remain fairly bullish in, in equity space. Otherwise, uh, how does this translate? Well, generally, when we've seen progression on that front, we have seen a degree of dollar weakness. That is a little bit apparent this morning. Some fluctuation seen in the dollar today. Uh, it's just recently bounced off its lows as I deliver this, but it is um, broken through what was the lower bound of the Dixie yesterday, and that's then promoted a bit of an extension of um, a moderate dollar weakness. So the major pairs have picked up uh, a touch this morning, albeit just seeing a bit of reversal um, off the pullback from the initial highs. Cable, a bit of a standout. We'll talk about cable uh, in a bit more detail in terms of the fundamentals in a moment. Uh, but you can see we've had a bit of a false break around this real important psychological and technical relevant level of 135. If we look on the daily. That 135, of course, is this a meaningful level that puts us up at around two year highs. I think going back to around Q2 of 2018, if we can really get above then that initial uh, false kind of move we saw at the beginning of the month, which was that um, election 2019, this time last year, pop that we had on a Tory majority, the beginning of SEP uh, and the area which we tested just a few weeks ago. So um, people still fairly um, optimistic and hopeful of a Brexit deal emerging, kind of a few comments from yesterday. Uh, we can get up to speed on that in a moment about what I think going forward. Uh, otherwise, uh, gold uh, has formed now a relative range, so looking to consolidate perhaps a little bit after what was a pretty phenomenal move over the last 24 hours or so because we've risen the best part of 30 bucks, really initiated by not the overnight but the previous night's Asia-Pacific session. 
and so we bumped up uh, whether or not this is tied to uh, the idea about um, the associated risks with things like the coronavirus with the increasing restrictions that we're seeing uh, in the US or in mainland Europe uh, or in the UK as far as the announcements and the, the kicking of the new tiering uh, system today uh, or whether it's more tied to still concerns about future forward inflation given the fact the success of this stimulus deal coming forward which has promoted at the moment dollar weakness and, and gold has continued to remain on the upside uh, as I said, somewhat consolidation now, 54.5 to 62-ish, which was the overnight Asia pack high. And you can see it was a little bit choppy, but uh, a rough area of consolidation we had back on the 9th and the low back on the 7th. So worth keeping an eye on that on the upside if we were to see any further more substantial gains in the yellow metal here, uh, as then we would look to target up at around the probably the R1, which starts to draw in some of these previous highs you can see here. Pretty much lined up perfectly to the T with the R1 at 68.5, which was the high on the afternoon on the 9th. Um, if you remember, uh, well, that was the 9th of December before we had a bit of a breakdown in price. Um, otherwise, elsewhere, oil respecting the technicals uh, quite nicely in yesterday's session in terms of the initial push up to the high, uh, which was the Thursday high that we printed, which was around the 47.74. So, yesterday it was a nice technical area. Uh, of resistance uh, with that high in the R1 uh, and just given the scope of the rally that we had seen from um, Monday night session after the initial dip that we saw on the OPEC cutting back on their demand forecasts. So again somewhat consolidation now so looking around the pivot level at around 47.29 to that uh, double top now at 47.74 would be the ideal areas to look at on the upper and lower boundary of that price. Uh, for the rest of the session ahead. All right, well, let's get stuck into some of the news. I've already really talked and got you up to speed with the general vibe on the GOP leaders citing progress in talks with Pelosi. So definitely we need to continue to track this. This will be one of the defining factors really for the second half of the week. Um, but then let's have a quick update on Brexit. What is going on here? Well, yesterday, as you would have seen, Sterling saw another pop on the upside and as I've just shown you this morning and as I'm just speaking, cable is at its session high now. So definitely worth keeping an eye on here because technically uh, a firmer move through 135 might see a, a bit more momentum to the upside if we can really push on. Now, one of the things yesterday was a BBC journalist called Nicholas uh, Wacht. So if you aren't following him on Twitter, I suggest you do so. Um, tweeted about a feeling among British lawmakers that a Brexit deal may be close. And that was enough then to really trigger uh, further acceleration to the upside in, in the pound. I think one of the most important things now is we need to see follow-up, more definitive confirmation that that indeed is the case. Remember, with a lot of this Brexit noise, which does create a lot of uh, kind of volatility and false movement in the pound, generally in a day trading environment, uh, a lot of this commentary is coming from journalists and hearsay that they've spoken to an official who's been part of a conversation or a roundtable meeting uh, of the negotiations and from what they're hearing, they're saying X. Now, what I need to hear is what's Y and what's Z and do they all stack up pointing to the same thing that indeed, yes, a deal is going to be imminent. Um, so there's a potential here for a buildup of potential negative kind of reactions. And given the market now, it's very reminiscent really of last week, I feel that people are quite bid up the pound into the idea of, yes, ongoing somewhat dollar weakness, but also um, optimism over a deal only then for that to kind of fall flat towards the back end of the week when we see seemingly no slam dunk concrete deal is signed. And therefore, um, as those comments start to emerge in a similar tweet fashion to the positive one yesterday, we start to see quite aggressive downside risk kind of flashes to the downside. And that can be largely born out of the fact that the market has moved considerably higher in the, in the prior session. So it's worth bearing that in mind. And actually overnight, sources in the Times newspaper here in the UK have stated that nothing was imminent on Brexit as of last night. Both sides are pretty certain nothing will happen immediately. Uh, and pretty similar what was echoed by Paul Brand of ITV News as well. So 
Definitely not a done deal yet. I think at the moment I feel like the pound potentially could move higher before then towards the back end of this week it starts to move lower and it perhaps quite violently so in terms of aggressive pullbacks as people get again apprehensive that the reality kicks in perhaps the deal is not going to happen uh, as, as soon as they might have think. So that's, that's the latest on Brexit. The other thing you've probably read a lot about, it's really dominating the national press at the moment, um, is guidance around celebrating Christmas. Uh, as we know, the government is set to um, relax the rules over a specified period of time so that um, family and friends can get together under certain criteria um, of intermixing of different social groups. Now, it's come under a lot of scrutiny because various different medical advisors have given advice to the government that this would be a bad idea. As we already know, the COVID situation, if anything, has worsened, particularly in the likes of London and the southeast of England, which has resulted in this change in the tiering system effective today, where approximately 61% or so of the UK now are in the highest possible um, category of tiering for the, the stringency of restrictions. So at the moment, there's a lot of pressure on the government. The latest that they've said overnight is that they're expected to strengthen the guidance, but not actually alter um, the, the rules about up to three households being able to, to mix to form a so-called bubble. Um, all four nations are scheduled to talk further today. Um, this, is a, this is, I'd say, a situation, a fluid one that could well change. I think the governments are going to find it particularly hard to do so uh, because of the, uh, the public reaction then to what that might mean over such a cultural period. However, polls have suggested that public opinion might be swaying in the way of actually um, people not particularly happy with the government handling and would prefer uh, to put actually new rules in place. So how much of an impact really does this have from a market's perspective? Quite honestly, Perhaps some, um, if we do remain in more strict lockdown and let's say let's say Christmas is off, um, I think in terms of containment of the virus, then uh, that would probably be very beneficial. Um, how much that, that would influence the pound? I mean, perhaps mildly positive, uh, given the fact that what a super spreader event like Christmas could have is something we talked about yesterday, which is um, what we've seen in the US post Thanksgiving, which is quite an acceleration in cases. And the problem here is that you know, services like the NHS, like in America with the US hospitals, they're near full capacity, which brings about big difficulties uh, in terms of not just people with COVID, but other people who also need to be treated for other different diseases and, uh, and, and so on. So, um, that being said then, I don't think the government are going to change what they're saying. I don't think that necessarily is a negative for the pound. However, it might well do so, I mean become negative, if then we see a big spike in COVID cases, if hospitalizations get to full capacity, of which is a risk, and then subsequent deaths start to rise quite sharply when we get into the beginning of January then certainly that at the time then will need to be factored in. As far as now is concerned, I think it's somewhat overshadowed by the fact that there's, there's this looming Brexit deadline that's in play that's going to be more of a near-term draw for the pound for the here and now. The other thing, of course, today, and probably the most important thing of the day overall for global markets is the Federal Reserve. A really fantastic article on the FT just summarising things and the four things to watch. So let me just give you the... The summation really of that. So since June, uh, in the early months of the pandemic, the Fed has been buying $120 billion of US government debt every month, 80 billion across treasuries of all maturities, and 40 billion of agency mortgage-backed securities or MBS. Uh, and they have said that they would maintain that policy, quote, and this is the wording, over the coming months. And it's that particular phrasing that's probably going to be the key thing to look out for when they announce their statement and then their subsequent press conference later on this evening at 7, 7.30 London time. So today it is expected to make a, a fairly significant signalling change in that regard, extending the time frame for those debt purchases by linking them 
we don't know to what specifically as yet, but linking them to a certain economic metrics in the recovery. So at the moment, instead of saying coming months, which is kind of say, although there's some wiggle room, there's an idea of, okay, so coming months means three months, let's say for an example, whereas if it was more tied to a certain economic metric in the recovery, well, markets can take um, somewhat confidence out of the fact that, well, look, if it remains like it is at the moment, and the economy, the economic data remains weak, like what we're kind of seeing now re-emerge in America because of the fact that COVID's been so violent and it's spreading, creating these new round of restrictions where jobless rates are going to go up and confidence is probably going to diminish in the period ahead in the short term. Well, that means there's nowhere near that the Fed um, uh, are going to exhaust their bond buying program. And that would be a net then more dovish move in terms of the language change. Um, so that's one of the key things. A more extreme scenario would be, um, but a very much so less likely option would be for the Fed to increase the aggregate size of its asset purchases. So it's not so much about the size, it's more about the commitment of the timing of how long they're tied to doing it for. Um, there are a couple of other things as well. People have talked about this idea of targeting then different parts of the curve to try and uh, pin down rates in the long end to try and keep then if there's a risk of a stimulus deal um, coming forward soon then that's going to create renewed demand in in the economy as we go through in the period ahead let's say as the economy recovers stimulus really starts to pay off in the in the actual real sense um, but it, so then the fed will be conscious of trying to hold down yields in the long end in order to keep then a lower lending environment perception if you like because um, the pressure that would put on credit where companies are pretty high on debt at the moment could be one of the biggest tail risks for markets under those scenarios and they will be conscious of that and in that kind of yield curve targeting fashion of which we've seen adopted by the BOJ or the RBA they won't commit exactly perhaps to that, but something akin to it by just moving out the average maturity of their purchases. Um, another thing to be aware of today, they're publishing their new uh, macroeconomic kind of forecasts. So similar to what the ECB did uh, just last week. Uh, good news on the vaccines may well lead to a rosier overall economic assessment. If the Fed does see solid macroeconomic um, improvement next year, it may lead officials to predict earlier interest rates than they did in September when the median prediction was for no lift off until at least the end of 2023. Um, I, th I think that's makes sense. I mean, the vaccine has come to market in a relatively quick fashion, which does give some cause for being perhaps a little bit more optimistic than where they were before. However, I would say the Fed under Powell, like under Yellen, who will soon be the incoming Treasury Secretary, is very much so of the disposition of um, kind of slow, gradual, cautious type approach. And I think if they're going to be any more bullish at all on their macroeconomic improvements for next year, it's going to have to be like outweighed, I would say, by a more dovish signal elsewhere, whether that's in the bomb buying language or somewhere else. Um, the other thing as well is, if you remember, there was this kind of whole slew of, uh, of emergency measures that got adopted by the Fed in response to the initial onset of the pandemic to offset the, the immediacy of the economic collapse that we saw in uh, post-spring. Uh, however, there's obviously been a rift developed between Powell and the central bank and the outgoing Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, where the latter wanted to pivot money back under um, from these underutilized programs back into more federal kind of spending. Um, and basically what, what markets might be looking for today is that the, the hope that perhaps then some of these uh, facilities get reinstated in the near future. Um, we know that Yellen is going to come in under the Biden administration. She's going to work in a much more collaborative fashion with Jerome Powell than the previous administration ever would have done. Uh, and as I said, knowing her characteristics from her tenure as the head of the, the Fed, it could well be likely that this is another form that the Federal Reserve could give that um, that idea of a very looser accommodative stance going forward for the fairly still uncertain period ahead to ensure the economic recovery. What does all this mean? Well, ultimately, 
A lot of this then um, would be supportive generally of equity markets. Um, if the Fed do tweak the language um, that's a little bit more accommodative of pinning it down to certain economic metrics, if they change the average maturity further out, um, if they kind of a, a lesser, let's say bullish in a macroeconomic forecast, which supports then more dovish actions from the central bank. And if there's conversations about reinstatement of some of these emergency facilities, because they're prepping up for them to transition with Yellen coming in, I would see weaker dollar, higher equities uh, under those types of scenarios. Um, so that's how I'd be interpreting things as we go further forward. But we'll, we'll, we'll get very much more into this as we uh, deliver this live later on Amplify Live. Um, finally, a couple of things. You had the API oil inventories last night. They really had no lasting impact. There was a momentary blip on the downside and then we moved back higher. The headline crew number of build of 1.973 million. Uh, that was a little bit bearish, hence that initial reaction. Um, Cushing a draw 165,000. Gasoline build 828,000. They're still at build 4.762 million. So not really too much there to, to speak of really. Um, uh, so we'll wait for the DOEs later. But as I said, crude is trading around technically some interesting levels at the moment. Uh, and just as we've been talking, we've seen a further extension um, of some of the movements uh, key metrics coming out this morning, and this leads us on to the calendar. So you've just had the French services PMI come in at 49.2. 49.2. Expectations were for 40. That is a phenomenally strong French services PMI number. And again, don't forget, this is for December. So people, analysts were expecting a very depressed number given the fact that we're in a fairly stringent lockdown at the moment across France, particularly the capital. Manufacturing in, in uh, the French flash PMI for December came in at 51.1, uh, and that's above the expected 50.1, so awesome French data there. And it's really fired up the market, as you can see here. So uh, the euro, look, just to give you an idea of the type of speed of reaction, if I stick this on a one minute chart, you can see just as we've been talking here in the briefing, uh, the euro has just bounced higher here. Um, nice, nice move breaking above then the early European entrance high. Bit of resistance being found at the R1 at the minute, uh, and that is quite a key area. You've got the previous um, high that was seen on Monday just above there at the moment, and this is an interesting area actually for the euro. If you look at it on the performance, this is going back through the month of December here. The euro is right up there at the moment at around that 122 handle. So we've got the R1, you've got the weekly high that was printed on Monday, sitting just above, uh, and then that takes us back to the third and fourth high. On the daily chart, what's interesting here is um, you can see we're just continuing to, to break out of what is quite a key area of which for the euro then um, does mean that uh, if we can really punch above today, coming days, this area, uh, it really does mean that potentially this onward uh, upward trend can continue over the medium term. Certainly, that would be the view of most who anticipate euro dollar to trade higher in the coming months on the persistent weakness of the dollar. But intraday key level of resistance here being tested at the moment in the euro. And you can see European equities loving it, uh, and rightly so. The French number, that is fantastically strong on the service side against expectations. I don't think in my 14-year career I've ever seen a 9.2 beat over expectations. But there again, we're in a different, unique era in the post-pandemic world. Um, and, and these numbers, the variance of them are particularly large at the moment. So the DAX has catapulted higher, you can see really uh, with an injection of that. The German numbers haven't yet come out. They'll come out at half past, but usually the way these PMIs work is that if the French number is very strong, the German number usually then people trade that ahead of time, positioning for equally a strong number. And you can see here in the S&P, it's helped as well. Technically, we were knocking on the door of that, um, the weekly high on Monday and that range restriction of price that we had. And you can see it's just uh, popped on the upside there through that level and, uh, and up to the next area of technical um, response, which is around 96.75, which brings in that previous high on the, the 9th and that range support that we had uh, through the 9th in the overnight session. So 
Uh, some quite bullish news here in the PMIs this morning. Uh, we got the UK PMI obviously coming out later, uh, and then you've got the US PMI also coming out. So another interesting chart to watch today will be for all those PMIs. You know, if you think about it, if all the PMIs are not as depressed as perhaps people might have thought, remember these are flash December numbers. If stimulus does get delivered, um, and we have no more hiccups in the vaccine situation. If Brexit gets delivered, um, you know these are these are very positive catalysts, which largely have been priced in by the market. But confirmation of them will probably see a bit of an extension on further relief, and it'll be interesting to watch as well the crude oil market. Um, if optimism generally is quite strong, we get some more positive signs on the stimulus with the U.S. Uh, manufacturing service PMI follow suit in what's likely to still be a fairly cautious, dovish sounding central bank in the Fed. This is kind of the perfect kind of semi Goldilocks scenario that could see then oil as well break out above this key area of resistance to push on certainly to trade at a 48 handle in the near term. Um, all right, I'm gonna leave it at that actually. Uh, the full calendar is available on Amplify Live. Uh, remember, we've got our guest speaker um, later who is this chap here who just happens to be my brother Matt um, so Matt started his career working at RBC in investment management he then um, was a trader for a US proprietary trading firm um, he then started uh, what is the world's leading squawk service uh, and now he is the CEO of a fintech startup called I push pull uh, so he's going to come on he's going to have a really great chat uh, a lot of questions at the moment about these rich tech valuations, but he's really got his finger on the pulse of a lot of emerging technologies and companies that might be exposed to those types of things on a single stock perspective. So really look forward to having a chat with him uh, with the rest of the community later on today. All right, guys, that is it. Uh, have a good day ahead and I'll see you on the live stream. Thanks very much.